From its early days to its rise as a dining favorite and the challenges that led to its unexpected downfall, we'll explore Ponderosa's transformation into a beloved household name and dissect the pivotal moments that led to its dramatic decline. What led to the collapse of this once flourishing empire? Watch to find out what stands behind the rise and fall of Ponderosa, a story of unforeseen challenges. Early Beginnings in 1963, Dan Blocker, leveraging his fame as Eric Haas Cartwright from Bonanza, launched the Bonanza Steakhouse chain, marking the beginning of a new era in themed dining experiences. Picture this, the first Bonanza Steakhouse opening its doors in Westport, Connecticut. Recognizing the untapped potential of this fledgling chain, the entrepreneurial Wiley Brothers acquired Bonanza Steakhouse in 1966, setting the stage for its rapid expansion. They were onto something big. By 1989, the chain had grown to 600 restaurants. But remember, this is just the surface. The real game changer is coming up. How this growth sparked a revolution in dining. Let's not forget Ponderosa's own story. Founded in 1965 in Kokomo, Indiana by Dan Lasater, Norm Weiss, and Charles Kleps, Ponderosa was more than just a restaurant. It was a dream taking shape. The move to Dayton, Ohio in 1971 was a strategic step for Ponderosa, as they prepared to launch their brand onto the national stage. As Bonanza was expanding under the Wiley brothers, Ponderosa was carving its own path. These were the early stages of what would become a significant shift in the American dining experience. These two chains, each with its distinct origin story, were on the cusp of transforming the casual dining industry in America. Cultural Impact but how do these steakhouses revolutionize the dining experience? The answer lies ahead. Here's where our story takes a cultural turn. Before Ponderosa and Bonanza, eating at a steakhouse was a big deal. Fancy and expensive. But these chains changed the game. They made steakhouses a place where any family could go, have a good time, and not worry about a huge bill. Ponderosa and Bonanza were some of the first places in the US to start buffets as well. People loved it because they could try a bit of everything. This buffet style became so popular that lots of other restaurants started doing it too. What's the catch? The fascinating twist in Ponderosa's journey is just around the corner. Expansion Ponderosa Steakhouse had cemented its reputation across the U.S. before even thinking of expanding internationally. Launched in the late 1960s, it became a hit with its all-you-can-eat buffet and family-friendly vibe. Americans loved the endless food options and wallet-friendly prices, making Ponderosa a go-to spot for steak lovers. Fast forward to the 70s, and Ponderosa was not just a U.S. favorite, but had also started to make its mark in Canada. 1972 marked Ponderosa's bold leap into international markets, starting with its first Canadian outlet in Windsor, Ontario. Canadians quickly took to the unlimited buffet style, finding both comfort and value in the new dining experience. Riding this way, Ponderosa rapidly expanded across Canada, at one point boasting over 60 locations. Challenges But success stories are not without its hurdles. The story of Ponderosa takes an interesting turn in the early 70s. The chain began expanding its operations in Canada, stretching its influence and brand presence. 1986 was a turning point for Ponderosa, as they made a crucial strategic shift to recalibrate their business model. Ponderosa during the economic changes during Ronald Reagan's presidency, known as the Reagan boom years, decided to refocus its efforts back to the United States. This decision led to a significant change in the Canadian dining landscape. In a significant industry move, General Mills Restaurant Group acquired 36 Ponderosa locations in Canada, signaling a major shakeup in the chain's operations. These were not just bought, but transformed as General Mills immediately converted them into Red Lobster restaurants, marking the end of Ponderosa's chapter in Canada. Back in the U.S. as Ponderosa grew, it faced increased competition. Chains like Golden Corral and Mandarin, along with local eateries, started offering similar buffet-style experiences, eating into Ponderosa's market share. Also, people began looking for different kinds of food. They wanted new flavors and healthier options. Ponderosa's menu didn't change much. It was mostly traditional American steakhouse food. Things took a turn in 1986 as competition grew and taste changed. Ponderosa's sales went down, faced with stiff competition and changing consumer preferences. Ponderosa's financial health began to decline. 
sales plummeted, and profitability became a distant dream. They started closing restaurants that weren't making enough money. A Tale of Two Steakhouses As we weave through this tale, we see two paths intersecting. In 1988, Ponderosa was sold to a company called Metro Media Restaurant Group. Joining the ranks of a larger restaurant group, Ponderosa faced new opportunities and challenges, reshaping its identity and business strategy. The next year, in September 1989, Metro Media made another big move. They bought Bonanza, another steakhouse chain. Both Ponderosa and Bonanza were now under the same company, called Metro Media Family Steakhouses. Metro Media decided to use both the Ponderosa and Bonanza names depending on where the restaurant was and what people liked. This way, they could reach more customers who liked either one of these steakhouses. But what went wrong? The major factors leading to Ponderosa's decline are coming up next. Financial struggles and bankruptcy. The journey with Metro Media wasn't smooth either. In 2008, the parent company faced bankruptcy, forcing over 300 restaurants to close. In a dramatic turn of events, Metro Media, grappling with severe financial woes, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, signaling deep-rooted troubles within the company. In an attempt to turn things around, they rebranded as Homestyle Dining LLC. Despite the rebranding efforts as Homestyle Dining LLC, the initiative fell short, failing to resonate with Ponderosa's target audience or revive its dwindling fortunes. In 2016, looking for new opportunities, Ponderosa engaged Trinity Capital LLC as its financial advisor. By late 2017, a new chapter began when fat brands, known for Fat Burger and other popular eateries, bought Ponderosa and Bonanza. But the problems continued. At its peak, Ponderosa boasted 700 stores, but by 2022, this number had drastically dwindled to a mere 17, illustrating the steep decline of the brand. The current state. Despite their best efforts, Ponderosa just couldn't catch a break. They had 700 stores in 1989, but by 2003, that number dropped to 400. Fast forward to 2022, and only 17 locations are left standing. In a modest recovery attempt by 2023, Ponderosa managed to stabilize somewhat, operating 54 locations globally, yet still far from its former glory. The future of Ponderosa now hangs by a thread relying on its charm as a family-friendly spot with prices that won't break the bank. But what led to this drastic fall? Let's peel back the layers and understand the decline of Ponderosa Steakhouse in more detail. The Shift in Dining Preferences Let's zoom into the late 1990s and early 2000s. Health consciousness was sweeping the nation, and diners were on the lookout for restaurants dishing out healthy options. The abrupt shift in dining preferences caught Ponderosa off guard, leaving them struggling to adapt to the new culinary landscape. Known for their hearty steakhouse meals, they faced a dilemma as their menu started to look a bit old school. For more intriguing deep dives into business stories like Ponderosa's, subscribe to our channel and share your thoughts on what you'd like us to explore next. While their competitors were quick to freshen up their menus with lighter, diverse choices, Ponderosa held on to its original concept a move that gradually seemed out of touch with the modern diner's preferences. Economic Challenges Ponderosa's downward spiral was further exacerbated by economic headwinds, including the 2008 financial crisis, which reshaped consumer spending habits. The 2008 financial crisis was a tough cookie, hitting the restaurant industry like a ton of bricks. Amidst the financial crisis, consumers tightened their belts, significantly reducing dining out expenses, a trend that hit Ponderosa particularly hard. You'd think Ponderosa with its wallet-friendly prices would be the go-to spot, right? But here's the catch. They hadn't really spruced up their menu or the look and feel of their restaurants. So despite being easy on the pocket, Ponderosa wasn't drawing the crowds like other budget-friendly places that offered a more up-to-date dining vibe management and strategy missteps. When sales started to dip, the decision makers seemed to be in a bit of a maze. Ponderosa's downfall was partly due to a muddled branding strategy, failing to establish a consistent and appealing identity that resonated with its customers. Imagine the confusion when customers visited different Ponderosa branches, only to encounter wildly varying quality and service, eroding the trust and loyalty crucial for a franchise's success. Not great for building a fan base, right? But how did these challenges impact their market position? We're about to uncover the pivotal moments that led to Ponderosa's decline, key missteps that turned the tide against this once popular brand. 
technology, and marketing. As the culinary world embraced digital innovation, Ponderosa lagged behind, missing crucial opportunities to connect with the digital savvy younger generation. While other restaurants were diving into social media and digital marketing to woo a younger crowd, Ponderosa was still playing the old school marketing game. This meant they were missing out big time on a huge chunk of the market. After all, we're talking about a world where people pick their dinner spot based on online reviews and how cool you look on Instagram. The Rise of Food Culture Fast forward to the early 21st century and there's a whole new food scene emerging. It's not just about eating anymore, it's about experiencing food. With food blogs, cooking shows, and culinary influencers taking center stage, dining trends were shifting rapidly. The new era of dining was defined by customers' quest for unique and Instagram-worthy culinary adventures, a trend Ponderosa failed to tap into. Stuck in its ways, they continued to rely on its outdated buffet model, which was increasingly seen as out of touch with contemporary dining trends. They were missing that wow factor that diners were now craving. Pandemic Impact Then came the COVID-19 pandemic, a curveball nobody saw coming. With dining restrictions everywhere and people weary of buffet-style eating for health reasons, Ponderosa's core business model hit a major roadblock. This unexpected crisis fast-tracked the closure of several more Ponderosa locations, shrinking their presence even further. What does this mean for the future of Ponderosa? What follows is a crucial lesson for all businesses. The imperative of evolving with changing times, illustrated vividly by Ponderosa's story, it's not just about a business that struggled, it's about the need for adaptation in the face of changing consumer habits and market dynamics. Looking ahead, the future of Ponderosa Steakhouse remains uncertain. For revival, Ponderosa would need to not only rethink its business model, but also reinvent its brand to resonate with today's consumers. If you enjoyed this story, click on the video you see on the screen to delve into another captivating chapter of food history.